Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Hey guys, it's so great to be here at New City, and um, man, we just we just really love you guys, and, and what an honor, you know, when this church was planted, it was like a seed planted, right, and we just got to be a little bit of water, and so we have prayed for you guys so much, we've invested a lot of prayer in this house, and this community, and so uh, we just get fired up to see your faith and encouraged by it. And we're encouraged by your leaders. I said this earlier, but um, Pastor Steve and First Lady Jesse have a Joshua and Caleb spirit, don't they? Where they just go get it, right? In the Old Testament, the spies are saying, no, this can't happen. We can't do it. But then Joshua and Caleb said, no, we got this. God's got this. Let's go get our inheritance, right? Let's go get that promised land. And uh, that's Pastor Steve and Jesse. And so um, we just love you guys. We love your church and just honored to be here. Good to be back in this area. I'm a husky, y'all. I'm a husky. <laughs> I grew up down the road at Neighborville North, but uh, District 203. Shout out to all, all those uh, graduating and beyond. So it's great to be back with you guys. I pray today as you've encouraged me that I can give a little bit of encouragement to you now. So I want to talk today about my title for my message is The Word is Life. The Word is Life. So uh, Dr. Carver, it was George Washington Carver, uh, was one of the most prominent black scientists and innovators of the early 20th century. And it was at a time when the peanut was underappreciated. And so Carver took an interest for that exact reason in the peanut. And it was used primarily for animal feed. That was where you threw anything that you didn't know what to do with. You just throw it to the animals. And so Carver, it was in the Tuskegee Institute that he affectionately called God's Little Workshop that he came up with over 300 uses and products for the peanut. And we're talking about all, all kinds of things. We're talking about flour and paste and lotion and paper and medicine and shaving cream. He even paved the way for the greatest Halloween candy of all time. Come on, somebody, give it up for the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Do you, are you with me today? Anybody else? Nothing holds a candle. Do you eat the edges like I do? I eat the edge and then I go into the juicy middle. I'm telling you. And the two is always better than the one. Am I, am I making that up? Am I making that up? Y'all said I'm making it up. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but here's Carver in the middle of his success. He's invited to come uh, talk to the U.S. House Ways and Means Committee about the peanut for a 10-minute presentation. So he goes and, and he talks to them, and they are throw, so enthralled by his work, they say, you know what, just talk as long as you want. So he opines about the potential of the peanut for an hour and 45 minutes. And at the end, the committee chair, he says this, he says, where did you learn all this stuff about the peanut? And he says, oh, I learned it from an old book. What old book is that? It's called the Bible. The Bible talks about the peanut that much. He said, then it doesn't talk about it that much. You know what it talks about, though? It talks about the God who created the peanut. And I got to know that God. And I started praying to that God. And I asked him, how should I use the peanut? And he told me. And here's Carver. His work and life is unparalleled. But here's the thing. His work and his life was born from his imagination. His imagination was born from his thoughts. His thoughts were born from the word. That's where all of it came from. Pastor Zeb Mengistu said it this way. He said, word produces thought. Thought produces life. Let me put it another way. Life is lived on a surface level, right? What you see in me, you see my actions, you see the overflow that comes out of me, and this is how we judge each other, but that's only the surface level. We understand that that life is a direct result of the thoughts within. And we understand that our thoughts within are a direct result underneath that of the word that was presented to us. Somebody spoke a word to you at some point that impacted you, right? Maybe it's a, a, a mom or... 
Maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's a teacher earlier in your life and they spoke something and it still rings true. And it kind of set a pattern for how you think about yourself. Maybe it was on the other side. Maybe somebody spoke a word. It was a dad or, or some influence or a peer that spoke something and it still haunts you. You still feel a sense of guilt when you go back to that word. But the fact is this, that life comes from thoughts and thoughts come from word. Let's start with life. Jesus said, I have come to give life and I have come to give it in abundance. Now, he wasn't saying, I have come just to give you a surface level blessing. No, he wasn't saying this. According to the National Endowment for Financial Education, about 70% of people who win the lottery will go bankrupt within two years. Have you ever seen these stats? We, we get easy blessing and it's kind of easy exodus. But this is what we want, don't we? We want the big house. We want the financial security. We want that job where we are independent from somebody else. We want the recognition. We want the commendation. But what does God say? God says, you know what? No, I'm going to give you something else. I'm going to give you a seed. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 13. And it's verses 31 and 32. And it says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So this table holds the key to the kingdom of God. And you probably can't even see this, can you? And you say, you look at it, you say, what? It, that's pretty small. What's that going to do? Well, I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to grow to become beautiful. It's going to grow to bring comfort to those who are around it, who are underneath it, who see it. It's going to grow to become something vibrant and colorful. It's going to grow. And when it grows, the overflow from it will not just impact itself, but everything that is around it will also grow larger because of what is in this. Because of this seed right here. God chooses not to use a grain of sand or, or salt, something the same size. He chooses to use a mustard seed because of this reason. There is incredible exponential potential within this right here. Now, a seed in my hand, it's not the size of the seed in my hand, but it's the size of the potential of the seed when it's planted in the soil. Are you with me today? A seed in my hand is just a seed. But a seed, when it goes in the soil, it is abundant life. It has immeasurable potential. God can use a seed. Here's the deal. The seed is the word. We are called to plant that seed in the soil. Now, what's the soil? Well, the soil is made up of all kinds of things. It's made up of old sticks. It's made up of mulch, of worms, of manure, of weathered rocks. All these things come together to make up soil. Basically, they're the items that we would otherwise throw in the discard pile, right? All the things that we would get rid of is what soil is made up. Listen, sometimes I feel like my life is made up of really good soil because it's all the stuff that goes into the discard pile. And maybe you relate, it's the failures, it's the frustrations, it's the death, it's the hurts. Maybe it's the divorce in your past. Maybe it's the trials or the tribulations, but all these things that we would otherwise throw in the discard pile as our life. This is soil. I'm walking with Renzi, my third little, little one, and we're walking down the street, our our um, church is about eight blocks southeast of the U.S. Capitol. So in between, there's all these wonderful flowers. And she loves to grow things. She's got sugar leaf and she's got peppers and she's got parsley and all these things in our backyard that she's growing. So we're walking and go down the street and say, Dad, it stinks around here. And I look around and there's fresh mulch laid. So I talk to her, Renzi, that's because of the mulch was just laid. And see those flowers that you love to smell? That mulch kind of protects them. And then we're out at the farm, actually with a guy who's, who's basically a soil specialist. And we're out walking the farm and she says, Dad, it stinks out here. Like, that's right. That's manure right there. <laughs> and, that's in this, and so it's a teaching moment. Number one, your spiritual gift is smell. You, you really smell, Renzi. And number two, here's the thing. It's almost like, Renzi, the more it stinks, the more exponential growth comes out of what stinks. 
Do you hear where I'm going today, right? All those things in your life, the ingredients of what makes up the soil. And here's the fact of the reality. That soil specialist that I was just with, here's what he told me. He said, all those things that come together to make the soil create the most potent, powerful uh, growth environment or ecosystem per square inch in the entire world. In other words, all that stuff that we were discarding, that we were letting go, that we had thought this stuff has no purpose. God says, no, I'm going to bring exponential growth and change to your life, not in spite of those things, but because of those things. Anybody given up on the situations in their life that you are just discarded, you are let go, you just say, okay, God can't use these things. God has a plan. He has a purpose through the pain. Are you with me, somebody, today? God has a plan in the middle of the problem. He is still accomplishing his work even when we are not attentive. He is still able to work through our circumstances. Western thinking sees a problem and we get uneasy, we get uncomfortable. You know, we have doubt in our faith. We think that doubt means that none of this can work then. And so we think this is going to blow up faith. But here's how ancient Jewish thinking went. It was when they came up against the problem of God, they actually danced for a day. Isn't that cool? They would dance for a day because of this reason, because they had discovered a new mystery that was yet to be revealed. The nation of Israel was born out of tension. Remember Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, he wrestles with God. There's this tension, and out of that he is blessed, and he's given a new name, which is Israel. Israel's name to, to wrestle, to conquer. That's how they were born, and so they were to wrestle with God, wrestle with faith, wrestle in community, wrestle for relationship. Well, this last week we hung out with uh, a couple of guys, and uh, one of them went to a school that I played ball against. And I remember this because it's the only time that I ever got ejected from a game. I'm not going to get into the details of that. There were some things said and thrown and done <laughs> that I'm not going to get into. But I will say this. There was some home cooking going on that day. You know what I mean? They were paid locally and they must have been paid well. So I go through and my coaches ticked off at me. So a couple games later, they're hacking my arms off. They're, they're, you know, cheap shots coming on, and the refs aren't calling anything, y'all. Come on, get fired up. And, and I start to unravel again. My coach calls me over. He's like, Joel, you're, st you're losing it. Come on. I know it's not going well. I know that refs aren't treating you right, but listen, this team needs you. I need you to lock it back in. Don't quit on me, Joel. This team needs you. I need you. We have a purpose that we are trying to accomplish together. And my brain locked right back in. In that moment, I needed that word and it locked me back in. And maybe that's a word for somebody here today, right? You, you have gone through some stuff this year. Am I the only one? You have gone through some difficulty this year that you have never gone through before. Something was said. Something was unsaid. Something hurt. Something was frustrated. You lost that thing. You lost that job. You lost that person. And you have gone through it this year. But listen... God still has purpose through our difficulties. Do you know that today? God still has purpose through our pain. He is still at work. And so I just want to say something. Don't give up. Come on. We need you. This team needs you. Your home needs you. Your kids need you. Your spouse needs you. New city needs you. Don't give up. God is still working. He is still accomplishing in purposes. Can I get one amen in the house today? Now, we know there are a couple of different uh, kinds of doubt. And there's, excuse me, a couple of different kinds of word. There's audible word and there's inaudible word. Now, the audible word we see in Genesis chapter 1. And God comes and he says, let there be light, and he speaks, and it comes into existence, right? And then in, fast forward to Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. It's the centurion uh, comes to Jesus, and it says in verse 8, the centurion says, if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. If you just say the word. And Jesus, this is the only time in all of Scripture that Jesus is amazed, 
Jesus, who is in the business of amazing other people, right? In this moment, he is amazed by this man's faith. If you want to catch the heart of God, understand the power that comes in his word. Understand that he can do all things through his word. So the audible word, and then secondly, the inaudible word. Now this gets into our thought life. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says we are to take captive every thought and submit it unto God. The most important real estate in your life. It's not your home. It's not your gym. It's, it's not even your church. Most important real estate in your life, it's the six inches in between your ears, right? It's right up here that we understand that, that if we allow this to go sideways... If we allow ourselves to to understand or to believe a false narrative, it's going to take us down the road and it's going to drive our actions towards the wrong direction. When we have this certain narrative, when when we allow a narrative of fear to dominate our minds, we're going to miss out on the opportunity that God has in front of us, aren't we? When we allow a, uh, a, an anger uh, narrative to dominate, well, we're going to go, we're going to act boldly, but we're probably going to act unwisely. If we allow other things into us, we allow uh, hurt to dominate us, then we're probably going to go around. We're going to miss those opportunities that God has created for us. But sometimes doubt just creeps in, doesn't it? It overtakes us. And, and so let me just ask you this. What's rattling around up here? What's going on up here? Is it a frustration? Is it a hurt? Is it something that somebody else said? Is it someone else's opinion? Is it that news outlet's opinion rattling around up here? Or is it the scripture? Is it a prayer conviction that came in your time seeking God and that's rattling around and you're allowing God to lead you forward? Life comes from thoughts, but thoughts come from word. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the importance of the word. And Revelation Satan is given a name. He's called the accuser of the brethren, right? And it says that he will be cast out or he will be hurled out. And so he's overcome. He's defeated. And, but the accuser, he comes against us in our weaknesses. How does the accuser come against us? He comes against us by word. How do we overcome him? We overcome him by word and by blood. And so we overcome him by the word that is born from blood, by the word that is born from the finished work of God, that is Jesus being sent to the earth, dying on the cross, going to the grave, being raised up, and coming up to the right hand of the Father and releasing redemption and victory into our lives. We overcome by the word and by the blood. It's not just word. It's the word of our testimony. That's different from just a positive word or positive psychology. It's different just saying good things and then good things will happen. No, we overcome. And so here's where the spiritual battle is not just on the life level, is it? It's not just on a thought level. No, a spiritual battle is on the level of the word. And so if you're having issues on a life level, what's going on in your thought level? If you're having issues on a thought level and you say, you know what, I can't control my thoughts. Well, what are you feeding your thoughts? What are you putting into your mind for your thoughts? What are you allowing? What information are you allowing into your brain that feeds the rest of what you think and then how you live your life? The report conforms to the word. The report conforms to the word. Listen, this last week, um, we had, uh, it was two weeks ago actually, uh, we had a prayer service on a Sunday night. And Dee Jackson shares this testimony after what happened because she goes into that prayer service and she feels like God has given her this word that, Dee, you are a healer. And so she leans over to her friend who has had back issues for months and she says, hey, can I pray for you? She puts her hand on her back. She prays for her. Then get, that night gets a text from her friend and her friend says, Dee, you're not going to believe this. Come on, somebody. You know where I'm going with this. D, you're not going to believe this, but you put your hand exactly where the pain was, and the pain is gone now. Wednesday rolls around. She gets another text. By the way, this is my executive assistant. And and she gets a text. She says, D, I just want to let you know there's still no pain in my back. 
D, what in the world? She says, Pastor Joel, I don't even know what happened. She says, I felt like I got a word during the week in my prayer that D, you are a healer. And then on Sunday, I was praying and worshiping, and I just had to step out from this word that God put in me, from this prayer conviction. I've been thinking about it all week. And she says, normally I run from this stuff, PJ. I said, why do you run from it? She says, Listen, because that's for pastors. That's for people with big gifts. Oof. Come on, you know you're not speaking truth now. Listen, D, can somebody talk to D today, right? Because that's exactly who God chooses to use throughout the scripture. And she says, I'm just D. I'm just little old me. You are not just D. No, you are a daughter of the king. You are your grandmother's granddaughter. You are chosen and anointed and appointed from God. And D, you are a healer. Why? Because you know the healer and the healer lives within you. And he that lives within you is greater than he that lives within the world. Are you with me today? (laughs) Nina, you don't even know this part of the story. Before that, so thoughts Our life comes from our thoughts. She was thinking about it all week because she had this word, D, you are a healer. Six months prior, I learned that Deb de los Reyes, in a prayer with D, spoke a word of healing over her. (laughs) So what came from the thoughts? It took six months for a word to germinate and come to fruition in the thoughts and come to fruition in life. The report conforms to the word. Now, it's a beautiful word of faith. But listen, there is t- truth is found in the tension of the opposites, isn't it? I'm not just talking about a name it, claim it word today. I'm not just talking about whatever you say, that's going to happen automatically. No, there's the other side. Sometimes we're disappointed when we're trying to believe for something, aren't we? Case in point. Uh, Keelan Douglas, who is the daughter of Pastor Chris Douglas, who is our worship leader at, at our church. She was born, and the report was a bad one. And so for seven months, she was in the hospital, and we're praying, and we're fasting, and we're hoping for a miracle. Guys, this is the little baby, the sweet little daughter. She's one, she's a twin. And so we're hoping, we're believing, and Keelan doesn't make it. And she goes on to glory. The beginning of May is the anniversary of that. So I talked with Chris and I prayed together with him. And he shared some thoughts with me. And I just asked him if I could share that um, with you today. So just just listen, receive what he has to say. He said, we were believing that Keelan was going to make it. That she would receive her healing. So we felt crushed when we lost her. In loss and pain, Jesus is undeniably present. You can't miss his peace, his kindness, his tenderness. There's the option to get bitter on the other side of it, though. But we have the opportunity to choose hope as believers. In time, in our journey, I think we realize that we're so conditioned to think here and now, not the eternal. But God has an eternal plan. The word doesn't always materialize the way we want it to. His word is not confined to our time and space, though. His word is bigger than four dimensions of reality. Keelan has received her healing. Death is not the end. We have shifted our perspective to look at a higher level. We have a bolder sense on the other side of loss than I did before. Don't be deterred from going after a word from God. His word will not return void this side or the other. It might not be in my time or in my way, but words that have been spoken over my life, I've tattooed them on my body, he said, to remind myself. It's an opportunity to return back to God's word. I don't run from the battle. I run to it. I don't run from the battle, he said. I run to it. Don't let your discouragement in the temporal stop you from going after God in the eternal. He is still at work. Do you know that? He is still on the move. He is teaching us in the midst of, you remember where we started today? We started with the seed, a tiny seed that you can't even see the potential. And here we are and we're together and you've got the contents of the soil. You've got the hurt and you've got the frustration 
and you've got all that makes up this dirt, and there looks like there is nothing good that could come out of this, right? It's just a bunch of brown dirt. But God says, no, I see your dirt. I see all that makes up that dirt, and I have given you something today, and it's called seed. It's called word. It's called hope. It's called life. I want to speak to somebody today. Do not be deterred by your situation. Do not be overcome by the overwhelming things that you're feeling in in here. You've got to attack that with seed, attack it with word, because maybe God has something to say to you. Maybe he's got something to do in you and through you. I want to ask you today to plant that seed in your circumstances. Plant it in the soil that God has given you, because maybe he wants to say something. Maybe he's got something beautiful to come out of your life, right? Maybe he's got something that might be a little bit vibrant to come through you. Maybe he's got something that it is and will flourish through you. Maybe he's got something that will actually be overwhelming and pouring out the sides of what you have been given in this life. Maybe God has something to speak into you today. Can I speak it over you? Can I be a prophet? Can I be a pastor in just a moment? So I just speak life into your soul today. I speak truth into your heart today. I speak redemption over those impossible situations. I speak hope where there is none. God, I speak fullness into the empty places. Lord, I speak regeneration where it feels like something is dead and not coming back. God, I speak salvation to the person that is ready to step out by faith into salvation. I speak that over you today. There is power in the word. There is power in God's word. There is power in his word. Step into his word today. Can I just give you an encouragement? How do we practically step out today? I know it's it's Celebration Sunday, y'all. I've never been a part of Celebration Sunday. I don't even know what Celebration Sunday means. But (laughs) small groups are kicking off today. And our, our, the groups this summer are going into the Word. They're talking about the Beatitudes. And they're getting together. And there's an accountability to do what you want to do when you get into a small group. Small groups have helped form my faith. I want to push you. I want to challenge you. Jump into a group. Today's your day. We kick off today. Take that step of faith. In Joshua chapter 4, the Israelites cross the river into the promised land, but he calls them to go back to grab a couple of stones and to bring them with him because they are making an altar of remembrance. It's to go back to original places of blessing. Can I just ask you right now? I just want to pray right now. And Pastor Steve, you can come. As our heads are bowed in prayer, I just want to ask you, where is that place where God gave you a spark of faith? What is that physical place where you saw the presence of the glory of God? Who is that person who lived out faith or spoke faith into you? When did you receive? Got to go back to that original place of blessing right now and remember word. Remember what God spoke in you and over you. And now, God, I just pray a blessing. I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill every person. I pray that the fruit of the Spirit would come out of us. I pray that the gifts of the Spirit would be on us. I pray that the ways of Jesus would be in front of us. And now I pray that the glory of the Father would be abundantly all around us today. Now we receive your word. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.